Okay, we're getting a little bit of a late start, uh, later than we thought we would. Um, so you may have trouble getting to the open house by five o'clock, but if post-mortem survival is a reality, <laughs> then we don't have to worry so much about time. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> the belief that we survive bodily death has been around for millennia but it's only been regarded as a scientific hypothesis for the past hundred years or so. The belief in survival is often attributed to our fear of annihilation or our wish to be immortal. But more cogently, it's also been fueled by experiences that people have that suggest to us that at least some part of us does survive bodily death. There are some people who still believe that Survival is a religious belief that is not amenable to scientific exploration. But I'm going to try to show you that survival can be operationalized as a scientifically testable hypothesis by focusing not on the belief itself, but on the experiences that give rise to it. Here we go. More than 40 years ago, there was a division started at the University of, of Virginia in the Department of Psychiatry with the express purpose of studying scientifically the question of whether we survive bodily death. The group has gone through a series of name changes since then, but now it is the Division of Perceptual Studies in the Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at UVA. And still after 40 years, we focus mainly on survival. The founder of this group, Ian Stevenson, was also one of the co-founders of the SSE a quarter century ago. For most of our life, we lived in this small frame house built in the 1920s, just off the main UVA grounds. Those of you who have come to past SSE conferences in Charlottesville may have visited us, us there. It was a great place for thinking and writing but when trucks drove by, the whole house shook, which made it hard to do EEG recordings. We currently have seven doctoral level research faculty, two research assistants, and a variety of students and volunteers that uh, vary in number from time to time. About a year ago, we moved into a new facility, which I hope you'll visit after this. It's about a mile across town, just off the downtown mall. And this building houses our offices, the Ian Stevenson Memorial Library, and our state of the, e state of the lab EEG lab with a uh, electromagnetically shielded room. Um, throughout all these changes, our mission has remained the same to investigate the scientific hypothesis that death is not annihilation, but merely rather a change of state. There's, there are actually many hypotheses uh, that imply postmortem survival. And I'm going to focus on just three hypotheses that have received the most empirical testing. They are that people who are now living have lived before, which is usually cast in terms of reincarnation, although it doesn't have to be. The hypothesis that people who are now deceased are still existing in some sense and the hypothesis that the mind can function independent of the physical brain. Now the first one, the idea that people who are now living have lived before, is basically that something that incorporates the personality survives death of the body and then reappears in a new body. Ian Stevenson almost single-handedly created this field of research. When you think about reincarnation type cases, the stereotype people usually think of is the Bridie Murphy, type, Bridie Murphy type story from the 1950s, where a housewife with no previous unusual experiences underwent hypnosis at a cocktail party and started talking in an Irish brogue and talking about a, a There are a number of problems with those types of cases.
And they all boil down to what's called cryptomnesia or source amnesia, which is basically knowing something but forgetting where you do it from, where you learned it. And memories that come to people as adults are highly vulnerable to cryptomnesia. You have a lot of experiences. It's hard to keep track of where they came from. Also, memories that come up under hypnosis are very vulnerable to cryptomnesia. So for these reasons, Ian Stevenson usually, almost always, refused to deal with memories that came up in adulthood or under hypnosis. Instead, he focused on young children, usually preschool children, who had memories spontaneously coming up about a past life. In the last 40 years, we've accumulated some 2,700 cases of children who have these past life memories. Now, this is not easy research to do. Most of these children live in countries where there was a belief in reincarnation. And these are generally in the Southeast Asia cultures. These kids usually live in remote villages, quite far from any means of transportation. And it's hard to get there. <laughs> this is Dr. Stevenson doing one of his field trips. In addition, almost none of these children will speak English. So you almost always have to go through an interpreter. This is a typical scene of being talking to a young girl with her parents present and the interpreter present. So what kinds of evidence do we get from these children? Most importantly are the very final cognitive memories that the child comes up with. Names, dates, places, specific details linked to the past life, which we can then check out against the facts of the person the child came to have been in the past life. This past life usually occurs in another village, far away from this one, sometimes in a different country, of which the child, the subject, has to have no possible knowledge. Secondly, most of these kids have personality traits and likes and dislikes that are very unusual for their family and which they attribute to the past life. For example, a child born to a Hindu family in India may refuse to eat the food his mother prepares and insists he wants food cooked for a Muslim family because he remembers a life in a Muslim family. Children who remember a past life of a different gender will often want to dress and play with toys that are appropriate to the opposite gender. There were a number of boys born in Burma in the 1950s who claimed to remember lives as Japanese fighter pilots who were shot down over Burma in World War II. And these kids in the remote jungle areas of Burma would have traits that people in Burma associated with the Japanese. They would want to wear pants rather than the skirt-like longi that the Burmese men wear. They'd want to eat raw fish instead of the spicy Burmese food and so on. Some of these kids also have skills that they were not taught and that their family does not know. Occupational skills, um, ability to play musical instruments, sometimes speaking a language that is not spoken in their district. We have, for example, children in a Sinhalese family in, in Sri Lanka who speak Tamil and their families don't. And then we also have children who have birthmarks or birth defects that they relate to the death wounds on the person they claim to have been previously. And these are usually very unusual birthmarks and birth defects that make no sense in terms of normal embryological development. And let me show you what I mean by that. These are the hands of a Burmese boy who remembered a life as a highway brigand, a life that was cut short when he was captured by vigilantes. He was about to be beheaded by a swordsman, and he held up his hands in a gesture of supplication to plead for his life. And his hands were chopped off. And this is how he was born. This is a boy born in India who remembered a life as a teenager in which he had an accident feeding fodder into an automatic chopping machine. He was feeding the fodder in with his right hand and operating the machine with his left hand. And his right hand got caught 